Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you uh, very much in advance for participating this evening, and a special thanks to our special guest, uh, Roger Lynn. Uh, Roger works at the Center for Biological Diversity's Energy Justice Program. He advocates for an equitable, clean energy future. Before he joined the center, he worked with environmental justice organizations throughout California. He has litigated extensive environmental justice and civil rights cases. And he's an author of Environmental Justice Law, Policy and Regulation, and serves on California's Disadvantaged Communities Advisory Group. Uh, Roger received his bachelor's from uh, Stanford University and his law degree from Golden Gate University School of Law. And I would like to add that uh, Roger's uh, a member of a very small select premium group of legal advocates for the environment and the energy uh, aspects of our life. And uh, we really uh, thank all these people for the incredible work that they do. So uh, I'd like to introduce Roger Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you for the time and being here. Uh, let me just share my screen for presentation. Let's see. Great, so as Phil mentioned, I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity. We are a species and habitats uh, protection organization, and we, uh, I'm also in our energy justice program. Um, Phil described what our program does generally, but I did want to highlight this little excerpt uh, from our website. And it is, it's not enough that our energy future must, uh, our energy future be techno technologically clean and renewable. It must also be just. And what is that? What What is a just energy system? Yeah, and to answer that, I want to go back to the summer um, and a lot of the rhetoric or the false narratives um, we've been hearing in from either the government agencies or in the hallways in, at the Capitol in Sacramento, that there have to be trade-offs. The climate emergency is so significant right now that in order to meet our climate goals, uh, we have to just act fast, quickly. We have to eliminate environmental uh, review of big transmission projects and big utility scale because we need more electricity. We have to move quickly and just forget about all the protections. Let's just get all of the transmission and utility scale stuff online as quickly as possible. Of course, I'm exaggerating that to prove a point, but there is this false narrative going around though that is unfortunately gaining in popularity that we have to just, we have to accept that there are trade-offs. Our program is not willing to accept that. And you know whether it's trade-offs to environmental justice communities or imperiled plants and wildlife, um, that you know we can meet our climate goals in a just way and not uh, eliminate or put or significant harm in other places. Um, and with that premise, though, I want to turn to today that. Oh, a key part of that, sorry, is that, uh, that the energy system we envision, a just energy system, also has to be built from the ground up. Instead of identifying, you know, how can we make, uh, you know, how, how do we just focus on reliability all the time and keeping the lights on all the time for everyone through just big projects. Um, instead, why don't we try to figure out what communities need? and then build up from there and build the energy system to meet those needs. Um, and you know, importantly, though, we cannot leave people behind, you know, in the clean energy transition, environmental justice communities that have borne the brunt of the externalities of our energy system, disproportionate impacts of pollution, are unfortunately, in the, under the status quo, stated to be lost in line. And, uh in the as we transition away from fossil fuels 
also last in line to be stuck with the infrastructure costs of fossil fuels and also the higher bills that that implicates. So how do we avoid that problem and serve the hardest to reach customers or hardest to reach residents of the state and the nation first um, as we transition away to our clean energy economy? Um, with that though, to go to today's discussion, I wanted to cover three topics. The first, uh, net energy metering. Uh, we are currently litigating the net billing tariff or NEM3 uh, that the Public Utilities Commission approved earlier this year that slashes the export value of um, net metering of rooftop solar. And we'll, I'll dive into the nuances of that case and why we're litigating it. Uh, next, I'll cover a little bit more briefly, but more urgently, uh, virtual net metering. And there will be a call to action at the end of this, uh, at the end of this presentation as well. Um, and then throughout this discussion, the, I'm also going to cover the terribly named, the absolute misnomer of non-energy benefits. Um, these are basically the externalities of our energy choices. So when we pick, you know, do we do wind, do we do solar, do we do gas, or do we do biofuels? We have to look at the costs and benefits of those first. Um, but we're not considering these externalities like local air and water pollution, uh, avoided land use impacts uh, to critical habitats or species. Uh, we're not looking at these non-energy benefits. And so that is a general call to action for just more awareness over this thing uh, that unfortunately has a terrible name because it makes you think that they have nothing to do with energy, but they are absolutely the externalities of our energy procurement decisions. Uh, so I'll hop to the first slide and what is net metering? Um, and apologies if this is a lot of you are aware of this, but just in case there are folks uh, who are new to this concept, uh, net metering is a billing system for distributed solar customers, so local generation uh, that does not require transmission, uh, local generation um, where customers pay only for the net electricity used each month, considering both the power going to the grid when the solar system generates excess electricity during the day and the power coming from the grid, particularly at night. Uh, which is why battery storage with responsibly extracted lithium or responsibly sourced lithium uh, is, uh, is critically important. So net metering is vital to, con to the continued growth of rooftop solar. Governor, prior Governor Schwarzenegger's million solar roofs uh, initiative was a success. Uh, we were, we achieved a million solar roofs, which got us, uh, which actually was a key part of us meeting our AB32 climate target. Um, and net metering was essential to that. So it's why are we here? Why is there all this debate about net metering? Why is it such a controversial issue? Uh, why across the country are utilities succeeding, unfortunately, in gutting net metering and slowing rooftop growth? I'll turn to the box on the right hand side. The, this gives a few examples of the utilities' efforts to gut net metering. Uh, Georgia, Nevada, notably at the Federal and Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC always industry-backed efforts making this happen. So an industry-backed group tried and failed to gut net metering across the country. Today's battles include California, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, Arkansas, North Carolina, um, Florida. Don't like, don't mention too many good things about the governor in Florida, but uh, the utility-backed bill to gut net metering did pass the legislature there that to then get vetoed by the governor. Uh, but the utility success to gut net metering turns on pitting customers against each other and ignoring the real obstacle to our clean energy future, and that is the big utilities' profit margins. 
Uh, let's just focus on this image on the top, the grid of the past for a second. I'll get to the new grid later on in the presentation, but the grid of the past, this is how it, it has traditionally been. Big utility scale generation from power plants, uh, generates electricity, over tra transported, over tra big transmission lines, finally getting to residences, schools, buildings, businesses, hospitals, whatnot. Um, that was a the grid of the past. It's a one-way flow of electricity that relies on centralized procurement. Um, and that is where the big utility cost shift myth comes from. And this is what the utilities have touted that rooftop solar is causing this unfair cost shift onto lower income customers. And so it, we have to cut the value, otherwise lower income customers keep getting, you know, keep having to pay for the grid and while other folks exit from it. The rhetoric is based on uh, the grid costing a fixed amount. Everyone has to pay their fair share. Rooftop solar customers get uh, who have net metering pay less than their share because they don't have to pay for certain things with they ha are having that uh, on-site credit or the export credit. And that leaves the rest of the customers to pick up the tab. If the richer customers have solar and the less wealthy do not, net metering then is a cost shift from the less wealthy folks to the more wealthy. And the cost shift is about how big utilities get their money. And this is, is really is all about their profit margins, which is illustrated by the next riddle that we have. Um, to bust this cost shift myth, uh, uh, let's think about a hotel riddle. And this is courtesy of Carl Rabago, who is an energy expert in the nation and also my legal director, Howard Crystal, co-author of the Rooftop Solar Justice Report, or principal author, um, who informed me about this riddle, but I think this illustrates uh, that the cost shift is a myth. Um, so let's see uh, if our moderators can answer this one. And if anyone wants to put some hints in the chat, please do. But three travelers book a hotel room. The hotel room is advertised at $30. But when the travelers get there, they each pay $10. So 10 each, 10 times three, $30. It turns out though, that the room only costs $25. So the hotel clerk gives the bellhop five $1 bills. The bellhop thinks, oh, I'll take a $2 tip. Takes $2, has $3 left, each $1 bills, and he gives each of the three travelers a dollar. So if you look at the travelers, each one has paid uh, $9, which is that $10 originally, subtracting the $1, uh, $9 multiplied by three, three travelers, 327. The bellhop took the $2 tip. The 27 plus two makes $29. So where did the extra dollar go? I was a little late getting into the check-in because I actually had to remind myself how to figure this one out. But that's why the cost shift myth is, it's complicated, you know, but it's, but once you, you break apart the myth, it, it's, it becomes much simpler. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer, Joe? No, James Castaneda said it went to stg and &E. That's exactly right, actually. I think that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> that is actually exactly right. Um, so the problem is the utilities want us to look in the wrong place. As soon as we start comparing each other as customers, we start looking at each other and the fairness argument over what's fair becomes whether someone down the street with rooftop solar or me or without rooftop solar, uh, who is paying more for their utility bill? And that is the, the paradigm, that's the cost shift issue that the utilities have put out there. Um, but this ignores many things 
mainly that the three dollars the the difference between the well the two dollars the the bellhop keeps but the three dollars that was returned to the customers the hotel folks that was the customer's money originally it was not the utilities money to begin with and so the utilities cost is not a fixed cost. It can be smaller or cheaper. There are ways to reduce utility bills through energy efficiency, whether it's insulation or just hanging your clothes out on a clothesline to dry. Um, and then there's some other benefits of solar that we can also factor in to decrease the costs that the utility faces. Um, but anyway, so it's this, the riddle is all about looking in the wrong place. If the, if you treat the money as from where it actually comes from, the twenty-seven dollars is uh, the twenty uh, nine times three plus the two that that makes uh, for twenty-five dollars for the hotel room plus the tip to the bellhop. That's twenty-seven. The rest is the three-dollar refund. You know, so the net metering is that credit that goes back to the customers it's not about taking not paying the utilities share or the hotel's share it is a credit that goes back to customers and by looking by making customers the three travelers look at each other instead of the overall system and like where who is paying for what and when and what kind of credit is given back that is uh the essence of the cost shift myth um, so that's a, the mathematical one. I'll get into other costs and benefits, why the cost shift is also a myth in a little bit. Um, but I will turn now to the second image on the bottom, the new grid. It's important to note with this one that uh, to the new grid, again, remember the grid of the past, for the image on the top, centralized one-way flow of energy um through big transmission lines here we have multiple different routes where energy can flow whether it's community solar uh whether it's uh electrifying mass transit energy of every building having energy efficiency or roof uh or rooftop solar and storage like warehouses and the important thing to note about this is that the lines are bi-directional they go both ways. There is no more one-way flow of energy. There are there are some, and but that's you know the grid of the past, and this is the grid of the future that we're moving towards with more community solar, rooftop solar, energy efficiency, demand response. Everything that's happening allows customers to adjust uh, the costs of the grid or the cost of the hotel room. Um, so, but it's important to note the grid is changing. So the cost shift argument only makes sense in that grid of the past where it was a fixed cost. In the grid of, that we're dealing with today, and that's going to be growing into the future, um, the, you know, we have the ability to uh, alter um, costs and there are avoided costs by rooftop solar that I'll talk about next. So going back to the cost shift, putting the mathematical riddle equation to the side for a second. Um, and this goes to the costs and benefits. So cost benefit analyses are how energy regulators in California and the majority of the nation make procurement decisions or decide whether to expand a program. The whole debate over net metering was looking at the costs and benefits of it, whether it's cost effective or not. Um, but if you're going to do a proper analysis of costs and benefits, you have to consider all of the costs and benefits. Uh, here, the regulators did, the Public Utilities Commission did consider transmission, but they only considered a little bit of the avoided transmission costs because of rooftop solar. Um, rooftop solar has enormous potential to cancel the need for transmission projects. I believe Bill Powers covered this one in his prior presentation with you all in 2018, the $2.6 billion in savings or the decreased hotel room costs um, that the, from avoided transmission projects. Because if we don't need, if we have more rooftop solar, we need less transmission. 
Um, so not to, I'm sure Bill covered, oh, sorry, um, using uh, SDG and E in his example, I'm sure Bill covered that the Sunrise Power Link project, um, he built an amazing analysis extrapolating that one out that it could avoid 1,000 per year in transmission costs um, if we replace the Sunrise Power Link with rooftop solar. Um, but what the Public Utilities Commission did in the ACC, which is their avoided cost calculator. So the commission has this tool called the ACC, the avoided cost calculator, that's meant to estimate the costs avoided by having more distributed energy resources. So, uh, and they estimated that at $87 per year for six kilo, for every six kilowatt net metering system. Um, and, oh, sorry, the, they estimated that at 87, but, um, but in reality, it's a thousand and that dwarfs the alleged cost shift amount, which was 580 to seven. Uh, eight, $780. Related to that, though, it gets worse. <laughs> um, the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission's analysis uh, for their avoided transmission costs, they looked at four plus billion dollars over five years. Um, so that was, uh, but in reality, and these are numbers from uh, the general rate case. So SDG&E files a general rate case, uh, uh, does a filing each year in their general rate case saying, this is how much we've spent on transmission. The PUC for their cost calculator put in that four plus billion over five years. But then if you look at avoided transmission costs that SDG&E and other of the utilities uh, claimed in their general rate case, that was four plus billion per year. So the Public Utilities Commission's tool, the ACC, underestimates by fivefold the amount of district of uh, transmission that rooftop solar avoids. Wow. And this doesn't even include the wildfire mitigation costs that are coming. Like we've we've seen a little bit of those in our utility bills. Um just today, the Public Utilities Commission entertained another increase in the revenue um, requirement from the utilities uh, to cover wildfire mitigation costs, undergrounding transmission lines, associated power shutoffs. Um, and so these the, the reliance on the bulk transmission system is just going to keep getting, keep making rates more and more expensive. Um, Add to that as well, in that old system, and actually the current system as well, there's a return on equity where the utilities have the best deal ever. If they build something, they get a certain return on equity for what they build. In this issue, uh, in California, the return on equity, so they invest $100 million, 20% return on equity, they'll get $120 million back. Um, you can't really beat that deal <laughs> in California. Um, and it's actually the highest return on equity in the nation. So all of this talk about like escalating bills, blame rooftop solar. It's for us, it's the sleight of hand to like, look at, forget about the wildfires that we caused, <laughs> you know, forget about our massive return on equity. The reason you have high utility bills is because of rooftop solar, and it's, it's and that's that is the false narrative that has dominated this net metering debate, which is why Bill's group, Protective Communities Foundation, Environmental Working Group, and our organization um, uh, litigated this one and is actually in court right now with the Public Utilities Commission. We're also in court over other values and benefits that the commission did not consider. Uh, the reduction in GHGs from not having to operate or build fossil fuel infrastructure that the that net metering displaces. Um, this is particularly um, important in environmental justice communities, given the peaker plants that we have there where you need to like switch them on quickly to like ramp them up really quickly to meet increased demand. Um, and then for those folks saying, oh, we're curtailing solar all the time. We have too much solar generation. 
we're only looking at utility scale when we say when we talk about curtailing rooftop solar in the energy com in the energy regulatory space is looked at as a demand modifier it's not looked at as a generation source so this whole all the rhetoric of like oh we have to we have we're doing doing too much rooftop solar during the day and it, it makes you know no difference if we if to you know to fossil fuels if we like you know if we curtail because we're curtailing so much you know so rooftop solar makes no difference but in reality community solar even without storage shifts the peaks that we incur um and then that decreases the need for peak plants if you pair rooftop solar with storage then you know we do even more and we won't even need and we could eliminate some peak plants as well uh related to that the public utilities commission also did not consider out-of-state methane leakage um they consider in-state methane leakage and this is the methane that escapes you know and uh from pipes and whatnot and it have that happens out of state as well especially when we're california is drawing power from out of state um we won't need as much of that if we have more rooftop solar and the public utilities commission is aware that there is out of state methane leakage their reasoning for not considering it was oh but we you know we we don't we don't really know how much it is <laughs> you know and, but the air resources board over here has you know is focusing on out of state methane leakage so it is possible to estimate how much out of state methane leakage is avoided by rooftop solar and and last but not least the disproportionate harms that climate induced disasters and the climate emergency pose on environmental justice communities in addition to the local impacts of um, local pollution from fossil fuels that uh, we won't need anymore um with more rooftop solar it, uh, it's the the damage that's done like environmental justice communities are first hit first and worst by the climate catastrophe um and the harms that are imposed on uh environmental justice communities because of our continued reliance on fossil fuels is something that we also have to consider um moving to the other side of the equation and then the, going back to non-energy benefits or public health impacts uh looking at a different energy source uh this is an image of a confined animal feeding operation in the central valley there are many of these as you know um and right now we the regulators the energy regulators in california are very big on biomethane saying it's it's gonna you know have the best climate impacts and it's cleaner and it'll get us to our climate goals faster um but if you don't consider public health impacts um you don't consider local air and water policy implications of energy procurement and the dairy biomethane projects are a good example of this where you need we need more and more dairies to make as much biomethane that we want biomethane is very very similar um molecular structure to natural gas so you can pretty much put biomethane in anything that runs on natural gas and what the utilities do is we sort of have their blend like a little bit of natural gas a little bit of biomethane you know and we'll just uh everything works fine that way and it's cleaner and better for everything and everyone um and we're capturing the methane emissions from the cows we're digesting those into biomethane so it's better in that respect but that ignores the fact that of the need to increase the herd sizes we've seen some project applications where dairies have had to triple the amount of cows that they have the triple their herd size in order to create enough biomethane um tripling the herd size increases local air and water quality pollution in or and around dairies this is a significant concern with groundwater pollution where certain communities in the central valley just don't have drinking water because of uh because of the contamination from dairies 
um, but we're not considering those public health impacts when we make our energy procurement decisions. Same goes to net metering and everything I just said about local uh, environmental justice communities or other communities that are in or around fossil fuel infrastructure that rooftop solar displaces. We do not consider the local air and quality benefits. Um, and that is something that we have to keep working on, keep, keep pressure on. And again, it has a terrible name, non-energy benefits, but we really need to socialize that term so that folks realize, oh, when the regulators look at costs and benefits and decide which energy resources to procure or deploy into the world, um, they should, but they do not look at these, these issues like local air and water quality. Um, reliability and resilience as well is an, uh, other benefits of rooftop solar, um, especially with folks with medical conditions, the need to refrigerate medicines, to maintain power in the household, or even keep homes or houses cool. Um, the heat waves that we've been experiencing all over the country, I think, illustrate the need for better resilient energy systems. Um, and resiliency uh, is, is such an important factor in environmental justice communities. Uh, resilience hubs are starting to gain in popularity and hopefully we'll get some uh, soon around, but these are not, resiliency hubs are not only for in times of emergency where people can go, where there is still power and you know, the power safety, power shutoff or a big disaster. Yes, these places uh, will still be self-sustaining and um, can have power during those times and can be there for the community, but they can also make communities just resilient in general. Yeah, it's like they have communities have an opportunity, like community centers, for instance, can yeah. end up being places that uh, have more um, like air conditioning or like or heating or other things for the community generally, but also in times of disaster. And for us, that's the importance of resiliency versus how utility companies look at it. It's like we need a resilient grid. If there's a and there, that's again, this is going to be a continual theme throughout this presentation. Like, do we want a resilient grid or do we want resilient communities? And it's really is the do we want to focus on people or do we want to focus on the electricity, the delivery system that guarantees profits with a, a significant return on equity? Going to our case, then the CPUC, the Public Utilities Commission, said we know resiliency is important. We know it's, it has a value. We know it's not zero, but it's kind of hard to figure out what the value is for a cost benefit analysis. So we'll just, let's just treat it as zero. Um, and a prior case that we did, uh, that the Center for Biological Diversity did uh, in 2008, or the decision was in 2008, uh, went on a while, and but it was against the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, or the NHTSA case, as we like to call it. Um, in the NHTSA case, uh, there was a fuel economy standard that was being developed, and we had to consider the impact of uh, carbon emissions. And in that case, the uh, the regulators there said, ah, it's, it's too hard to quantify, so we'll just treat it as zero. But again, that's another situation where uh, the courts and the, the long line of case law as well that came out of this one, where the court said that if you have a uh, value and you know it's not zero, you cannot zero it out. It has to be, you know, you have to do your best to consider it, even qualitatively, but you have to consider it. But if there's some value, you can't just treat it as zero. Um, so that is a that's one of the claims in our case right now. Um, impacts the species and biodiversity as well. So and this goes back to again to the false rhetoric of like build as much utility scale as possible, like giant trend, like giant solar farms in the desert, big transmission lines bringing the power to urban or other rural areas. But we just need to act as quickly as possible. Um, but that ignores the avoided from distributed generation, the avoided environmental and land use harms from fossil fuel plants. And 
badly sited utility scale solar and wind projects. Um, the image here is of the uh, solar project, a big solar farm in the Mojave Desert. With the, the little guy, the desert tortoise, uh, moving along there. And, and it's unfortunately great. The habitat is ideal for utility scale projects um, from the utilities perspective. But we we have to avoid the impacts. We are the the the, the connectivity that's important to maintain. We have to address uh, and not diminish the importance of that. Um, and also natural carbon sinks as well from displaced forests. Um, you know, and it's our natural lands. Like we cannot just chop down our natural lands to put utility scale stuff because those are the real carbon capture or carbon removal things that we need, the nature-based strategies. And we should not go to this is the second bullet point here, to carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration technologies that are unproven, expensive, even if they do work, present significant local impacts as well, um, and are just false solutions that will not work. So, but the real solutions, we need to maintain our natural carbon sinks. Um, and another reason to focus more on rooftop solar as well, this isn't in, uh, in, this isn't necessarily in our case, but just from a practical matter, there isn't enough land for utility scale stuff. You know, even considering offshore wind, um, we need a million acres um, plus the siting of transmission to to meet our climate targets. There just simply is a not enough land that does not implicate destroying or extincting, making species extinct um, to make that happen. And we have to rely on the built environments as well, like infill developments, existing buildings. Uh, every school, church, home, business should have rooftop solar instead of resorting to these other strategies. Um, and from the 2021 SB 100 report uh, that the Air Resources Board, Energy Commission, and the Public Utilities Commission put together, the build out rate um, is also problematic for utility scale. Uh, and in that report, they said we need 2.8 gigawatts per year of utility scale to make it to our climate targets. Uh, the current build rate of utility scale, though, is only one gigawatt per year. So again, this goes back to that false narrative of like, just get rid of CEQA for transmission, just speed up everything. You know, it's, uh, we, we definitely, distributed resources are faster to get online, they're cheaper and they're more feasible and have more community benefits, which is what I'm getting to in the next slide. Um, the local economic and job benefits that net metering creates including local clean energy installation jobs. Um, there are more jobs and um, I'm happy to send this slide presentation around, but there's a link here to a report on how there are more numerous, uh, more jobs in uh, net metering or rooftop solar installation, sorry, than, uh, than in fossil fuel jobs. So uh, local generation means more local jobs, means more local um, economic developments. And we're also, the Public Utilities Commission is also considering something now that we are really trying to push as well called a distribution system operator, which is just like KISO, the independent transmission system operator, um, in that uh, it would be a local transactions at the local level, aggregating DERs at the local level, maximizing the, their benefits, and offering a way for hopefully for folks to get compensated again for their energy in addition to net metering as well. Um, so the the potential of a market for local transactions from distributed energy is is the potential is, is big, and we should definitely try and harness that uh, before we just decide to just like, like forget about everything, just the utility scale transmission only. Um, we do that, we lose all these local benefits. And I'm going to turn to virtual net metering now. 
And again, for folks who might not be as familiar with virtual net metering, uh, it is vital for community solar project participants who acquire part of a project solar generation. So these are for renters. So virtual net metering is uh, the net billing tariff that was NEM3 is for homeowners or building owners. Uh, virtual net metering is for schools, farms, churches, like, you know, other folks, are, um, but for people who are renting their roofs. And each side you'll see in this image, whether it's the school, a family, or a corner store, like each each array gets divided up, um, and then there's uh, the same compensation uh, arrangement as net metering, um, and then the same incentives that make distributed solar attractive for homeowners. It's also there for renters, but it's also there for now. Uh, this concept is uh, what's at risk is on-site netting, and that is how we net out our energy use. So if we, if I use, uh, if someone uses two hours, just to keep it simple, two hours of electricity at home, and they have a solar panel that helps them generate that two hours of electricity, their bill nets out to zero if they own their roof. If you go to a renter, though, um, same renter, uses two hours of electricity, uh, has solar panels that generate two hours of electricity. The Public Utilities Commission is, uh, is now proposing to remove on-site nesting and for on-site consumption to be only compensated through the avoided cost, um, that ACC value that I had talked about, which is uh 75 percent less approximately 75 percent less than the full retail credit so to go back to the two hour example if i use two hours of electricity and i'm renting i get 25 percent back i get 30 minutes worth of electricity compensated back to me from the utility so you look at the homeowner you look at the renter and this is not exports Everyone gets the same, which is, and that's why we were challenging the decision because net metering used to, for exports, you would also get the full retail credit, but then the decision we're challenging decreased it to that 25% amount. So we're challenging that export credit reduction. Um, it's even worse in the virtual net metering because even on-site consumption, folks get compensated for on-site consumption at the avoided cost values, that 25% less as well. You then get to the demographics, um, and this is the race issue as well. The, if you look at majority homeowners um, and then majority renters, majority of renters identify as Latinx or Black. We do not have that same majority people of color in the homeowner uh, world. So we have two different demographics. We have two disparate, two different ways of treating people under the same program. Um, this is a significant issue, and we hope that the commission does the right thing. Thankfully, they pulled. They were going to vote on this proposal this month. But after a lot of advocacy, uh, they've held that now until October. They're thinking about it a little bit more, and they're going to come back to uh, vote on their decision in October. We hope there will be some changes. And with that, I will take us to the next steps. Um, want to end the, my discussion here and uh, with uh or call to action in some respects but also some good news in that uh our case against the public utilities commission for an, the net billing tariff for an m3 and again we're with bill powers as group protect our communities foundation and environmental working group the three of us are in that one challenging the public utilities commission who are also joined by sdg and e sce and pg and e um we filed our lawsuits back uh, earlier this year, and just this morning we found out that the Court of Appeal 
has granted the petition, which means that they will hear the case and we're waiting to see when oral arguments will be scheduled. This is a massive hurdle to cross very, very few environmental challenges the Public Utilities Commission decisions make it this far um, because, and this goes to the insulation of the Public Utilities Commission, you can't challenge them and go to superior court. The, our constitution says that if you challenge the Public Utilities Commission decision, you have to then go to the, directly to the Court of Appeal. You skip Superior Court. The thing is, the, the Court of Appeal doesn't have to hear our case. They could have said, no, 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 this is uh, the PUC knows what they're doing. We're going to give deference to them. We're not going to hear this case. But thankfully, we crossed that first hurdle. We're still going to have to work hard, though, and make sure that uh, we can convince the court of our arguments and all the omitted benefits from the cost-benefit analyses that we were talking about earlier. Um, and we'll see what the court says. So good news to end today, but then also the call to action. Uh, I'll start at the end, the non-energy benefits, the externalities. Again, non-energy benefits, uh, it's a terrible name. It's the benefits are absolutely related to energy. They are they are the externalities of our energy decisions. We are not, we are externalizing the externalities. And if there are any economists in the room, what happens if you keep externalizing costs? We land at the climate emergency we're in. And that's, you know, we have to stop doing that. We have to start looking at the consequences of our energy procurement decisions. So non-energy benefits, please socialize that term, throw it around, start talking about the externalities because those are things that are not considered in cost benefit analyses right now. And last but not least, virtual net metering and happy to answer any questions on this um, after this. But, uh, and this is a little, blurb from one of our allies but speak up for solar for renters schools and farms next thursday uh september 21st at 11 a.m uh there's a puc meeting that's happening at the cal epa building in sacramento for those of you who really want to go on a field trip from san diego and go to um and go to the sacramento please do but there are opportunities to dial in virtually and participate virtually um and a lot of our allies and friends are uh it's not again it's not on the agenda like thankfully we've had it kicked over to october but if we this is our last chance to show a really really big showing about how like we can't gut net metering or virtual net metering as well like at least keep that on-site netting if the export credits we'll see what happens with our litigation with the export credits but we like we have to protect that on-site netting for renters uh right now and so call to action for the, anyone that's interested um again i appreciate the time i did want to end a little bit earlier so that we could have like again a more of a discussion over these things um and happy to answer any questions you have. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, as Janice said, we're going to trade off with multiple people asking you questions. And I'd like to start with uh, just picking up what you were talking about in the virtual net metering. I'm a renter, you know, the Jones family or the corner grocery store or whatever in, the, in your example. Uh, how did I get to have the right to get any energy out of the solar field? Is this a, is this a community solar uh, array that I buy a piece of or buy stock in or, or, or whatever? And that uh, who, who funded the development and the deployment of the array in the first place? And you know how, how, do, how do I as a renter get access to any return on on a virtual net metering basis mm -hmm. that's a great question yeah it was developed as part of uh the mash program the solar uh, multifamily homes um so and uh but then it eventually became part of net metering in that 
it became a specific alternative to encourage you know more distributed resource distributed generation um and so it's, it's the structure of it was created through a lot of advocacy uh thankfully the public utilities commission got it right when they did the virtual net metering they were like okay there's this thing net metering for homeowners we have to do something similar for renters um so the structure of it and the payment structure of it um, is ordered by the, the Public Utilities Commission to actually participate in it. And uh, that's something to get in touch with your landlord about and, uh, and potentially other landlords around and see if folks you know, would be willing to like come pool resources together, um, find a developer, um uh, a solar installer who can then do it for uh your either your building your or your home or even your neighbors and have a whole collection of folks to do it and um it's the the incentive structure that's built into vnem as it currently is 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 quite appealing for developers um they'll take a cut of it they'll take a cut of the export of the credit that you get and that is why this program the protecting vnm is so important because you know like obviously we in in the best case scenario all of the benefit would go to the tenants but in, in our society we have to pay someone to get it built so it could be what we've seen is that it's actually free that for the renters to make this happen, but you have to have a developer who's savvy enough um, to uh, be able to uh, understand how to do the accounting and, you know, but it pencils out. And under the current system, because of the on site netting, um, again, the developer takes a little portion of that to pay, to pay themselves back for building it. You know, again, usually the tenants don't pay anything for it, um, but the developer does. The developer gets a little bit back from the virtual net metering thing though the the structure that i just described and unfortunately we've heard from some developers that uh who work nationally they're just very honest and just say like look we have to leave well we have to leave california if if this on-site netting cut happens because then we can't get paid it's it doesn't pencil out for us to make this happen mm. um, but to, to stay with that for just a moment, uh, if I'm a renter, I have to find a developer or a build, my, my building owner to persuade them to to uh, install the the array, assuming VNEM even pencils out. I mean, am I understanding that right? So that's part one. And part two of this question is, can we turn to our uh, CCEs to be the developer? Oh, that's a good question about the CCAs. Yeah, um, I think so. Yes, I am not familiar with not all CCAs are created equal, um, but I think it's definitely a good question to inquire with the CCAs uh, over in your areas. And um, another great thing that the CCA up here, uh, I'm in Oakland in Northern California, um, the CCA over here is developing something called virtual power plants as well that everyone can participate in, which is different load modifying things in different homes. So we can shift energy around several different homes um, and have a virtual net metering thing as well and just sort of like collectively make everything feasible and that's through the CCA. So uh, I think inquiring, having landlord inquire with the CCA is a great first step. Thanks. Janice? Uh, yeah, um, several questions came into the chat and they're on a variety of topics. I'm going to go in order which they were received. The first one was from Don and he mentions that in the 1980s and early 90s there were um, many energy efficiency programs um, related to uh, commercial lighting, retrofit, custom incentives, et cetera. And today the only utility funded programs seem to offer minimal rebates, things like smart thermostats. Um, 
How did the utility energy efficiency programs change since then? Um, there's, I don't know how the programs themselves have changed, but what I do know is that with this, the the same issues apply, like this cost shift idea, you know, and we've like saying like, you know, the, we one thing that we've argued with rooftop solar is how, you know, like what about energy efficiency? You know, it's the same thing, like folks are using less energy. They're not getting accused of an unfair cost shift you know, but then throughout that proceeding, the net metering proceeding, it started testimony from utilities and other expert, uh, other experts with other places started saying, well, actually, yes, there is a cost shift <laughs> with energy efficiency as well. Um, so I'm sure if you haven't heard of the income graduated fixed charge, that is a thing where it's a proposal by uh, advocates of the cost shift. Um, this actually came out of uh, um, the, the um, UC Berkeley uh, has a think tank that is unfortunately funded heavily by the utility companies. Um, and they were the ones who were like, okay, there's this cost shift. To get rid of the cost shift, the best way to get rid of the cost shift is to increase fixed charges. So right now we don't, uh, uh, the fixed charges are earning so much, and then to have an income-based one um, where, and these are things that the, the charges, charges that we get that are irrespective of usage. Um, there's the, their thinking and they're the ones, the masterminds behind like this false narrative of the cost shift. It, um, it's an income graduated fixed charge would be the way to tackle that one. So the higher, higher income you have and the bigger fixed charge you have. The problem with that, though, if you look at the fixed charge getting bigger and then the, the variable charge getting smaller, you know, like you have less incentive to do energy efficiency. You know, so going back to Don's question, I don't know the answer to how the energy efficiency programs have changed over time. But I do know that they're also, unfortunately, uh, on the utilities radar right now is something that through this income graduated fixed charge proposal to try and limit. And it all goes back to that need to have the centralized procurement. You can only get your energy from us and we must get all of our return on equity back. They're arguing that the low income um, families will save money through this program. Is that the case they're trying to make with the, the graduated fixed rate? Yes, yes, definitely. And, uh, and which may be true in some situations, um, but it's those other situations where income verification is a big issue um, that, yeah, there may be folks who don't want to report their income and then they suddenly get stuck with the higher fixed charge. There may be folks who are undocumented and, you know, in that case, cannot verify their income and then they get the higher fixed charge as well. So the income verification, there are going to be lots and lots of gaps um, in, in um, issues that are related to that, yes. The, the next one in the chat comes from John, and he would like to know if things would be better if the CPUC members were elected rather than appointed. Um, that I, I don't know about. <laughs> um, I think it's, for me, the, the issue is, um, I mean, I mean, Possibly, but it's, you know, I, I, what makes it makes me think of the the access to these folks, I think. And uh, in some proceedings, like the net energy metering one, where you uh, it's it's a proceeding that affects rates and any proceeding that affects rates or has the potential to affect rates. Those get triggered, uh, those get flagged as rate setting proceedings. If something is a rate setting proceeding, then you have to do uh, ex parte 
notices, which means that before you meet with a commissioner, you have to file a notice saying you're going to meet with the commissioner. After the meeting, you have to file another notice saying, yes, I met with the commissioner and this is what we talked about. And then you add on top of all of that, I mean, ex parte, I just said it for one, you know, and like I'm an attorney. I remember being in law school and being like, what the hell is an ex parte thing? And, you know, so even the language barrier and even the, the, the things that we deal with, like net metering, export credits, you know, like virtual net metering and all these terms, transmission, distribution. There are so many barriers that keep the Public Utilities Commission and I've been practicing there for over a decade, and it, it is like a little club. Like eventually, you know everyone who practices there. You see folks who are going to meet with other people, you know, and no surprises, the utility companies meet with the commissioners so often, all the time, you know, and, you know, and then for us, it's like it's resources to do that ex parte notice, to do the reporting, and it's like, um, you know, and recently, uh, there thankfully is this program called Intervenor Compensation, where you can get paid to participate in uh, certain PUC proceedings. Um, you have to meet certain requirements. The requirements are generally fairly liberal, but recently, there's starting to be a tax on certain parties to be eligible for intervenor compensation. Um, and you know it should be open to the public you know like if they if the public utilities commission really wants the input of people then it should make it easy it should they should have this program the intervener compensation program be more easily accessible so folks can just use it easily but oh it is such a pain in the ass to write a request to get paid for intervener compensation as well and you also get paid a year or two down the road as well but Anyway, what I'm trying to say is there's so many barriers to just having members of the public, whether it's terminology, whether it's these procedural things, just being able to participate in these things. So whether an elected official could make a difference or whether it's still governor appointed, I don't know about that, but I do know that we have to do something about all of these barriers as well and if it's an elected official maybe that could be the first thing on the agenda uh, but i don't know thank you joe do you have a question sure uh one of the one of the clear positive directions we could go in roger is seems to me is to have an automated demand response mm -hmm. uh set of tools where, for example, uh, uh, a message could be sent into your home, assuming you've got the technology to receive it and process it, that says, you know, lower the lower the AC for a bit or, you know, turn off some lights or do something, you know, if you're, especially if you're not home. I mean, the variety of automated demand response uh, possible applications is enormous. And yet I don't see any movement toward getting that technology implemented, or at least not much. Uh, what do you think we could do to facilitate uh, automation of demand response around our network? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And uh, it takes me back to, was it this summer or early in the summer? I think it was this year where did you all get that alert as well? Like, turn off your power now. <laughs> like, the state is going to have a power outage in certain areas. And and we did it. You know, we didn't have a power outage. Because, like, and not everyone responded to that. But, like, the number of people that did respond to that, like, oh, okay, I'll turn off my power right now. Like, yeah, it was uh, enough. <laughs> it was enough, right. And we made it. We were okay. We didn't need to build another fossil fuel power plant. <laughs> um so I absolutely agree with you, Joe, like demand response, like automated, we call it demand flexibility. It's sort of like the automated version of demand response. Um, there's a demand flexibility proceeding going on right now. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of advocates in that space. We're tracking that proceeding as well uh, because we really wanna push for it and to make it as, as, uh, as beneficial as possible. But the income graduated fixed charge, for some reason, 
got into that proceeding and is taking up all of the attention in that proceeding for now. And what does income graduate a fixed charge have to do with demand flexibility? Not much. <laughs> no, I have no idea either. But that's where we are right now. Um, but hopefully, uh, when the hopefully the income graduated fixed charge proposal will go away, <laughs> um, and then the focus can then turn to demand flexibility. But there are a large number of advocates um, uh, focusing on that one. Well, the virtual power plant that I was talking about as well. I think that's a huge, huge part of a virtual power plant as well. So there's. There's development of it happening. I would get in touch with your CCA, you know, point to Marin Clean Energy, which is the CCA that we have up here. Their virtual power plant is like, has made the news. It's it's really, really good. And uh, if your CCA doesn't have one, maybe try to pitch them and go to their board meetings and see if you can get one just, going. Just to, just to build on what you're saying there, Roger, uh, there's a community in New Zealand with 22,000 homes mm -hmm. that put microgrids or, you know, tiny grids in everybody's home, solar and batteries. And they set up a virtual power plant uh, technology and they organized it so that your battery never falls below 20% of its capacity. So that if there's a need for energy, the system can walk, you know, reach into your battery and, and retrieve the energy, and you get paid for the energy that comes from your home into the into the system, into the grid, and the entire set of twenty two thousand homes worth of uh, microgrids was paid for in something like eight months. Wow! And, and you know, after that, people can actually, I mean, that community is a power plant, right? Mm -hmm. In, in effect yeah. and and so they all get to benefit from you know income uh, this kind of this this is a, one of the potentials from intensive rooftop solar right is yeah. to really really do things like this that are transformative to a community mm -hmm. i think that's it. yeah that's a great example yeah i did not know about that one i'm going to check it out though for sure because we need more examples of the good stuff and it goes back to what i was it makes me think of like how you know the big thing that we focus on is like how do we start from the ground up like identify a community like community what do you need and like how can we provide a utility service to you versus saying we're building this you must have part of it now you must pay us for what we built um, and then some <laughs> and then some yeah so it's a, you get rid of the top-down approach how do we go from the ground up and um i think that the ccas are a great opportunity to make that happen but again not all ccas are created equal um, but there is tremendous potential in them janice thank you where joe and i live in vista we haven't we aren't the CCA is just getting started. I don't remember when we'll be able to join, but it's it's soon, so we'll see. Next year, yes. I think, Janice. Um, Leslie has a, a question about car charging, and she'd like to know if it costs less to charge at a public charger than using time of use if you take into consideration the transmission cost. Uh, sorry, the question was if you, is it, does it take longer to charge or? No, if you go to a public charger, mm -hmm. is it cheaper than charging at home time of use if you take into consideration the transmission cost? Oh, that's a good question. We might have to do yeah. some research, Leslie. Yeah, no, that is a good question. I imagine that it's the the savings because, uh, well, I mean it's maybe not, but I do. We would need to research it because there's the there's the reality, in which case the reality I would say, oh no, we don't need the transmission, so it's got to be cheaper. But then again, how the regulators look at the avoided costs is an issue. So whether the re the real avoided costs flow down to the customer, as you've seen in the rooftop solar example, is a big is a big question. Yeah. 
Hey, Leslie, we have some homework there. <laughs> um, let's see. Don wants to know if the CPUC were concerned with costs falling onto low income customers, why not add rooftop solar as a standard measure to the existing utility low income weatherization program? They already have installation crews in the field who could be cross-trained to install solar. The legislature has also discussed paying for low-income solar via the state budget to avoid adding to rates. Yeah, so. and it's, you know, even that, you know, for us, like when we first got into the rooftop solar debate, you know, my my immediate knee-jerk reaction was like well why don't we if okay just ignoring all the public all the costs and benefits for the cost shift all the holes in the avoided cost calculator or whatnot um just taking the cost shift as real for instance like for a second um and if you get more folks on solar in low-income areas or everywhere for that matter then there is no cost shift anymore. Um, so for me, the issue was always barriers to uh, solving the barriers to access to rooftop solar. That for me, that's always been the issue in rooftop solar. It's not about who ha you know is there a cost shift going on because again, if, we, if if even taking the cost shift analysis as real, there is no cost shift if, if we get everyone on rooftop solar. So why don't we just try to get everyone on rooftop solar as well and um, economies of scale, whatnot, you know, and, um, but now I agree with Don, like it, it should be like, you know, every home, every school, every church, you know, should have rooftop solar right now. And a lot of churches, like we were in this fight, we've been alongside lots of church, church groups being like, we want rooftop solar on our church. So, um, it, it definitely makes sense. There's uh, one more question in the chat. Uh, Niels would like to know if the lawyers from Earth Justice are involved, if you, if you work with them on um, the projects you're involved in. Mm -hmm. Well, we do in, uh, in certain projects, yes. Um, in the net metering one, unfortunately, the Earth Justice was representing Sierra Club which took more of a middle of the ground position on this one as well. So um, definitely allies um, and uh, great, great lawyers over there. Um, and we're working with them in some spaces, but not, not the rooftop solar one. Thanks. Joe? Oh, I could ask several more, but let me just ask one, Roger, um, that it's sort of, I was listening carefully to or trying to listen carefully to what you were saying, and it occurred to me that there's an opportunity to change policies that would transform our society. And it's related to the accounting and externalities. As I think about it, the oil companies, the fossil companies are selling fuel, and the fuel ends up treating our atmosphere as a sewer, and then the cleanup of the sewer from the oil company's point of view is an externality. That's not their business. But we as society get to get to deal with the mess that their products made. Suppose we changed our accounting system. This would be a transformative policy, and I know it'd be a big lift, but suppose we changed our accounting system and when uh, such that when externalities are defined that are socially expensive, we require the companies causing the externalities to pay for them, to pay for the cleanup mess, so to speak. In other words, take the concept of e externalities in economics and, and, and nullify it conceptually from a policy point of view. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, I think we've talked about the polluter pays principle for a while. Yeah, and it's, um, I worry though, and like what we see is, you know, exactly what you said, Joe. Like it's, yeah, like, uh, the, the 
sort of kicking the can down the road saying like, okay, we may have, don't worry about our air pollution or water pollution because we're going to have our air permit. We're going to have our water permit and the, the water board or the air district or the hazardous waste, you know, the Department of Toxics and Substances Control, like we'll have our waste permit. Like, don't worry, we'll comply with all of our permits. We know they don't. <laughs> yes. So, um, so it makes... It, it, I worry that it may it, because it's like okay I'll pay the fine you know like it's I'll pay the violation fine whatever it is no big deal um, I remember working on the before the energy space I used to work in the oil world and uh, the Chevron refinery in Richmond up here in Northern California and this was in 2012 or so but the average revenue per day at that refinery it was 200 million i don't who i don't know what their costs are but per day 200 million um i remember they got hit with the biggest fine when the richmond refinery exploded in 2012 they got hit with the biggest fine in air district history for a pollution violation i think it was like a i want to say it was a million dollars um but again it was a while back but either way the amount of money that they make in a day versus like, you know, just being like, okay, I'll just pay for it down the road. Like, um, I agree with the pollution pays principle, but it has to somehow guard against that. Like, okay, I'll just pay it, you know, I'll do what I want and I'll just pay it. Even if it's just a fraction of like my revenue per day. Yeah. Well, the, the payment has to be substantial enough to cover all of the cleanup costs, in which case uh, we might get different behavior. You know, if we if we made it severe right. enough, and I, one, oh, sorry, just quickly, one thing that I think is something that we've started to look at, and some advocates have started to look at, it's related to your question, is insurance. Um, hmm. I don't know about the oil companies. Oh, actually, I do know about the oil companies. Um, what is it? I want to say their name is Oil Insurers International. Um, but anyway, so if you are a fossil fuel company, you have to have insurance um, to do exactly what you're saying, Joe. And like, but what happens is they all self-insure each other. So uh, if you look up the, I think it's Oil Insurers International or something, that their acronym is OIL. Um, and if you look at who, like, whenever you do a pro, like the Public Utilities Commission, for instance, you have to, when you do a general rate case, you have to file, like, don't worry, I have insurance. These are the people who insure me. They all self-insure. Yeah, so that's similar to what you're talking about um, in that respect. But it's, and if there's another research project you all want to do, would be to, like, find out who insures the fossil fuel companies. I think mm. you'll find that a lot of them are self-insuring, um, but it's a nice little research trail to to go down. To go down yeah. Some of our allies are starting to, or have like Sunrise Movement is the one organization that is uh, beginning to, a uh, Sunrise Project, sorry, is beginning to go down that way. Well, an optimistic note maybe to, to end on, unless there are more questions. Uh, I have a long background in computing and i remember probably some of the others on the call do the time when we had big beastie mainframes mm -hmm. and we had this thing called time sharing right we all had to have a little piece of the time sharing and it's very much in a sense like a big power plant right mm -hmm. we we get a little piece of the action and then somebody came along and invented this thing called the pc and Within milliseconds, PCs prolifer proliferated and the time-sharing business died, right? It basically died overnight. It doesn't exist, uh, you know, except maybe at a, within a company or a, a research lab or something. Uh, I think the movement toward distributed energy resources is absolutely unstoppable and you know at the end of the day the uh the big power plant business is going to have to cave to distributed action 
distributed transactions. That's an opinion anyway. No, I love I think that's a great way to end this one as well. Like it's the benefits of distributed generation is like to to whether you're looking at it from the environmental justice standpoint or the conservation standpoint for biodiversity. For me, everything is connected, that connectivity issue. So it's you know, it's uh it really is uh i i hope and i love love the example from new zealand of the joe like it's yeah um i i i i'm hopeful that we'll get there because the the benefits of it are just so much more it's a just energy system which we're trying to get to we 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 have to and the technology is going to take us there just got to either that or our society will collapse i mean th th that's the choice <laughs> something thank you so much uh, roger merrill so roger uh on behalf of nccca we oh, no really, way. we really <laughs> appreciate your time and your your sharing with us tonight and your presentation and we have a practice of purchasing a tea a tree for all of our speakers in the um uh burned out forest someplace in california your tree will be precisely identified for you with uh you know coordinates of where on the planet it is you can go visit it if you choose to and uh, uh make sure you please send us your uh, mailing address and we'll send you the uh plaque uh, uh identifying your tree and that is incredible and very generous of you. Thank you so much. I I did not expect anything actually from this, <laughs> so, um, except for you know, right com great conversation. Um, but no, thank you very much. I'll uh, I'll email you over. Um, I'll send you all the powerpoints, which uh, in my email, which has our office address and um i i really really appreciate that thank you it's been it's been really nice having this conversation tonight and it's lovely great. to have you we really appreciate it thank you so much for your time and knowledge